Okay, so uh, let's move on to what was probably the, the biggest mm -hmm. discussion at this meeting at uh, ASCO and I think also will be upcoming uh, at EHA. Uh, where are we uh, with uh, cellular therapy, particularly T-cell therapy? Uh, the first thing to be said is that um, as we talk about CAR T-cells, uh, we're uh, focusing on uh, what will end up being a spectrum of cellular therapies, I believe. But for now, at least, there's a big focus on uh, CAR T cells, uh, obviously, uh, with the uh, different uh, generations of uh, creation of these CAR T cells with different uh, molecular uh, uh, surface antigens and uh, internal co stimulation, uh, uh, signal one, signal two, and so. Uh, the first thing to be said is that uh, with all the different technologies, uh, there are uh, different types of CAR T cells. They're not all the same by any means. And so this is uh, an issue in terms of interpreting the data. Uh, the logistics for, for patients looking in, uh, this is basically a procedure uh, similar to transplantation where on the left uh, you have the cells removed, uh, you have the creation of the manufactured CAR T cells, with a particular target uh, on the surface of the cells, uh, then the culturing of those cells, and then uh, the reinfusion of these cells. And you can see right off that there could be some variability in this preparation process, which takes two, three weeks. Uh, and so a whole different concept of therapy, not where you go into the clinic and you get your chemotherapy at 2 o'clock. <laughs> Very different. <laughs> you might come back a month later if it's all set to go. Uh, we have several trials focused on the BCMA CAR T cells, so the B cell maturation antigen, which is rather universally expressed on myeloma cells. So the, the four uh, groups of trials uh, targeting the CAR T cells against the surface ant antigen, uh, the Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, UPEN, uh, BB2121, and uh, the, the ALCAR, which is the, uh, the legend uh, trial, which was presented at ASCO last year, actually. Uh, uh, I'm going to focus particularly on the, the BB2121, which was uh, presented in update form at ASCO, and a lot of uh, interest in that, uh, both in terms of the efficacy, a uh, very high response rate, uh, a lot of attention to what was the safety in this trial. Uh, I think that there was a reassurance that uh, only a small number of patients had the uh, cytokine release syndrome, the rather dangerous uh, side effect that can have uh, neurologic side effects, for example. Uh, so uh, many patients had lower levels of cytokine release syndrome, but uh, only a few with the higher level. Uh, so a, a lot of uh, enthusiasm about the efficacy with the hope that the toxicity would be uh, manageable using steroids or other measures to control uh, what is going on. Uh, I think that there was a big focus on what is the depth of response with this therapy, and uh, this is showing here that with the different levels of dosing, if you give more cells, uh, you get a better response and perhaps a deeper response. Uh, but I would draw attention here to this footnote. Uh, there are two things about looking at MRD in this setting. The first thing is that the MRD occurs very quickly, mm -hmm. and we're really unsure how to interpret that uh, because we, we're used to measuring MRD, which occurs progressively over time. The other thing is that we do need to look closely at what is the level of the MRD, and uh, most of these were at 10 to the minus 5, only a few at 10 to the minus 6, uh, one was at 10 to the minus 4, when, so that when you say MRD negative, you do need to look at the footnote down here right. <laughs> and see what was the level and what was the timing and how are we going to interpret this. Uh, but I think the big thing that was discussed at ASCO was these are heavily, heavily pretreated patients, patients who've had many, many lines of therapy, uh, and uh, what do we think about the fact that the average remission time is 11.8 months? Uh, is this good if, if for patients who have deep responses, uh, perhaps a little bit longer? Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, uh, a lot of enthusiasm, uh, but also thinking already about what's happening in terms of 
Uh, why are these patients progressing or relapsing? What kind of things are going on? Will this be a, a, a therapy where it needs to be combined or maybe repeated, where you give one infusion, maybe you'll need to give another infusion to, 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 to do a better job? So a lot of uh, questions. So questions about uh, how will we give the CAR T cells, how well do they work, and what should we be aiming for in terms of our goal uh, relative to other therapies that we have? And so maybe I'll just stop with this slide right here. A lot of questions about CAR T cells. And so, uh, Sagar, you maybe want to go first. What, what's your perspective on the status of CAR T cells right now? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, our lymphoma colleagues and ALO colleagues were ahead of us. Uh, but I think we've rapidly caught up and maybe even <laughs> ahead of them a little yes. bit to a certain extent. I think the data that we saw updated in, at ASCO on BB2121 is really very exciting. 11.8 um, months, uh, basically a year for median yes. PFS. Um, if you remember back to the days of bortezomib in that same patient population, PFS was less than six months, carfilzomib less than six months, daratumumab less than six months, and now here we are at, at almost a year. If you compare it to the lymphoma CAR T cells, it's four times longer yes. than what was seen in the... So, so much better in myeloma. Yeah, yeah. Now, the question is, do we have a plateau and a tail on the curve, as we've seen in both ALL and lymphoma? And it's probably too early to know, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's certainly one of the important pieces of information that we hope to get in the next, in the next few months. Right, yeah. right. And Joe, what do you think? Yeah, no, I feel similarly. I mean, I think what it's done is it's uh, the, all the hype that there was right. around CAR yes. T cell therapy. In one way, it validated it, you know, to take a patient who, you know, even the, the, the presenter, Dr. Rajay, was telling us yesterday, I mean, a lot of these patients were sadly literally on their way to hospice. Mm -hmm. Like, they had just mm -hmm. no other options. They exhaust every option. To give those patients, on average, another year uh, mm -hmm. before they progressed, let alone overall survival, I think is very exciting. I think, on the other hand, is also a reminder that it's not a cure-all either. Right. You know that there were right. challenges with the drug. Not everybody responds. There are relapses. Obviously, we'll talk more about the types of relapses and what we do for them. So for me, it was, it was I mean, I agree with Sagar. Th this is definitely going to be, I think, a part of what we do in the mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't want people to get the sense that this is the cure-all for everybody, and once someone has CAR T-cell therapy, they, they won't need anything else. And In fact, now right. we have an interesting cadre of patients who have relapsed on CAR T that we're trying to figure out what's best for them yeah. thereafter. Right, right. But, but I was very encouraged by that 11.8 months. I mean, that's, yeah, it's, it's, that's it's, the, by far the longest progression-free survival or PFS right. that we have seen in any CAR T-cell therapy in myeloma. Right, right. So I, so I do you're, think you're, it's worth addressing the CRS question. So you, yes, the you, toxicity. Yeah, you raised the, the cytokine release as a potential <laughs> adverse event. And at least in my mind, I think about it as similarly to tumor lysis syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, where you have highly effective therapy, and you just have to know how to manage and mitigate that. Right. Now, it doesn't mean that CRS is something you, you ignore or take with a grain of sand, but there is certainly an experience factor at a center in being able to deal with CRS. Right. And I don't think about that as a reason not to use a CAR T cell. Okay, yes. And so yeah, th right. then there's still a, a uncertainty um, if you have a, a lot of CRS. Is that a lot of uh, reduction in tumor burden? Is that actually a good thing, you know? Mm -hmm. right. uh, so it's not necessarily something to be completely avoiding. Right. Uh, but look how far we've maybe evolved. To modulate. Yeah, uh, look how far we've evolved. I mean, that, yes. in that first trial mm -hmm. a couple of years ago that we discussed at one of our conference series, right. out of those first nine patients, six of them went to the ICU. Right. Mm -hmm. So now we're seeing, right. you know, dramatically less than that. So that's encouraging. Yeah, and whereas now I think with grade one, certain types of grade one CRS, we're giving TOSI early right. rather than waiting for them to be in the right. ICU before we give it Bingo. to try and preempt right, it, right. and that may be important. Right. And so uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Jonathan Kaufman, he said that uh, this is not just mm -hmm. CAR T cell, but it might be um, uh, the Model T. Uh, and we, <laughs> we, we need to wait around for the Maserati to come along. Right. Uh, right. So do you think that, you know, we're, we're, we're just at an early stage in, in having the final kind of CAR T therapy? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is our first foray into it. And we're all trying to figure out what's the best construct, what's the best cell type. Yeah. I think there are manipulations to the source of cells. Right. So are there things you can do to patients to manipulate their T cells prior to collection? Right. Are there things you can do in vitro with the T cells to mm -hmm. make them more effective? And are things that are there things you can do to the host after reinfusion that may give you longer or better to, longevity to the T -cells. of the T cells? Yeah. So I think those are all variables we're starting to deal with. Right. Right. 
And so the, we don't need to talk about this too much, but the, the last thing I have here, number four, I mean, the cost, the logistics and the cost, I think it is certainly going to have an impact in terms of how this rolls out. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, uh, I, th I think it's, you know, when I look at this, it's just a little too early to determine that because, one, we haven't worked out all these kinks, as it were, where I think it will right. get smoother and easier and potentially even cheaper. Um, and then, of course, in the long term, there is this concept of off-the-shelf CAR T-cell-like therapy. Absolutely. It may not be the exact same mm -hmm. where we take someone's cells, manipulate them, you know, expand mm -hmm. them and give them back. Maybe we can have an off-the-shelf-like approach which may affect that. So I'm not burying my head in the sand of the no. cost, but there has been, I think, a little excessive hype around the cost of CAR T-cell therapy. You know, obviously any new therapy is going to be particularly more costly until we work out the details. But um, right. I look at this as going, it's going to be another excellent option for certain patients, but mm -hmm. probably not universally across the board. Obviously, we'll have to see with time where we use it. If we're only using it in that very heavily pretreated right. patient, or might we be bringing it up earlier in treatment? Right. If you bring it up earlier and it has a decisive benefit, mm -hmm. you know, our therapies, our current therapies, combos are two, three, four hundred thousand dollars for a right. combo for a year. And so right. if this gives uh, earlier in the disease a multi-year benefit, then, you know, the cost effective ratio is, is good. And, and I think, you know, I think all of us are beginning to explore the idea of with multiple highly effective agents, and CAR T cells are one of them, um, that the duration of therapy question is one that we're beginning to ask. Right. And so if you want to talk about cost-benefit, yes. if we can stop, then things all of a sudden have a very different cost-benefit ratio. Absolutely. And uh, right now with our current therapies, that maintenance uh, seems right. to be quite important. Correct. And that, that cost is there. Right. 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 Yes. So a follow-on point is, uh, what about the other uh, ways of targeting the BCMA? And uh, we didn't talk about this too much, but obviously with the, um, the GCK product, uh, monoclonal antibody uh, armed, uh, right. uh, quite good responses, not quite as good as with the CAR T cells. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, Joe, what do you think about this? What, what, where do you see uh, those fitting in versus the CAR T? Yeah, I mean, as a myeloma doctor, I want more options, right? Because <laughs> yes. every option could work better in a different patient. I'm excited that CAR T cell therapy, as Sagar was saying, is not just one kind of model. Right. You know, you want different, uh, you know, not to, to push the analogy too far, but you want different cars for different trips, right? Sometimes you want the bigger van, sometimes you want the <laughs> sm smaller uh, uh, sports car, or however you want to get there. So actually, I do think that the antibody therapy, which you showed directly um, hitting BCMA, could actually be almost like an off-the-shelf-like approach, as we've said, where there isn't right. all the manipulation of CAR T cell therapy. And I'm actually quite excited about these bi-specific antibodies, or this notion where an antibody not only hooks onto the to the tumor cell, but hooks onto one of the cells or something in the immune system and engages the immune system. So right. leveraging this concept that now we use so extensively, antibody therapy with some of the concept of CAR T-cell therapy. It might be one that's a little bit easier to administer, mm -hmm. doesn't involve all the cell processing, because we think about the sheer number. I mean, if we have problems doing auto transplants in some patients uh, because of access, doing CAR T-cell therapy could be a challenge right. too. So right. I don't think this is gonna replace CAR T-cell therapy in some ways. I think it's going to be, again, where you match the patient, the disease to the best right, approach right. possible. Well, one uh, thing that I picked up on uh, at our summit here was uh, it's going to be a lot easier to combine uh, these antibodies right. and uh, w with right. other therapies. Right. And so I was encouraged to see trials coming along with a combo approach where right. it's a lot easier to, to, to do that. Yeah, yeah, and and I think you know one of the one of the current challenges with CAR T cell therapy is the gap. Mm -hmm. What do you do between when you've collected the T-cells and right. when you want to infuse? And many of the current patients, that's a long time yeah. to go with nothing. Absolutely. And many of them have seen a lot of therapy, so the options are not great anyway. Right. Um, and so I think whether these 
bispecifics or antibody drug conjugates can be bridges. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think it would almost be really interesting to think of them as a test dose. Mm -hmm. If you respond to a BCMA-directed therapy, yes. it's a predictor of a responder to a CAR T-cell. Right. So it, it would be really curious, yeah. again, from a cost perspective, and, and I'm just yes. sort of thinking through it, if you don't respond to a BCMA-directed right. non-CAR, will you respond to a BCMA CAR? Absolutely. And that may be a way to say, maybe your benefits less. And right, and, think and about there was some else. early discussion about yeah. that. We really don't know at this point which patients are likely to benefit right. the most, and if we right. did know that, it would be hugely helpful. Yes, right.